Hey everybody, Cold on here with another Vox Immortalis commentary guide. This video is for Heroic Warmaster Blackhorn and Dragon Soul, and this is 10 man. So before we get into the video, uh, just know that this is a very challenging encounter, and I think it took us 120-ish, maybe 130 attempts to finally get down. Um, but it's much more difficult than any of the previous heroics that you might have faced in this zone. Uh, probably a couple orders of magnitude more challenging, at least for us. And there are a couple of reasons for this, but essentially the fight has a number of mechanics that sort of work in tandem or unison with each other. So that if you do poorly on one sort of mechanic, this will uh, chain into making it harder to deal with other things. And this will lead to a wipe, basically. So it's kind of a severe learning curve. Uh, there's also a few sort of quirks and even a few bugs that are left in this from design uh, that make it kind of annoying sometimes you get situations that are wipes that weren't really your fault so i'll talk about how to deal with those in a moment but uh, essentially this video is going to be in two major parts we'll go over phase one stuff and then i'll go into phase two there's a lot of things to cover um, so there's ship health which is the core mechanic of sort of the fight revolves around the ship's health there's the deck fire uh, drakes elites and sappers all the ads that you'll deal with in the first phase uh, phase two against Blackhorn and Goriona. And then I'll talk about overall healing, tanking, DPS strategies that we use as well. So let's go ahead and get started. Now, just like the normal version of this encounter, the Skyfire, the ship you're on, uh, will has it, have its health meter showing. And you have to do everything you can in, in your power to make sure it doesn't take very much damage. Uh, unlike normal, however, you'd probably be able to ignore most, if not all, the mechanics that damage the ship and just burn through the fight. But on Heroic, the ship's health is the key factor in this encounter. Um, it's more important than anything else, and there are a number of abilities that lower the ship's health. Uh, a lot of them are from normal difficulty. So we have the Onslaught, you have Twilight Barrage, um, you have the Sapper Explosion if the Sapper reaches the cabin. And then you also have a new ability on Heroic called Broadside, which is cast by Goriona. And Broadside basically takes off 20% of the current health of the ship, the remaining health at the time. So as the fight progresses and the ship's health gets lower, Broadside does slightly less and less damage. Uh, that said, you can't control Broadside. It's just sort of a soft and rage. You, you know, you have to do the fight in a certain amount of time or else broadside will just get it so low you you'll run out of time uh, other than that the other three mechanics are all from normal but they're very important so to begin we'll talk about sappers because that's the simplest uh, sappers should never explode if they do you're doing something very wrong just communicate with the raid when a sapper's coming um, death knights for death grip or stuns from pretty much any class are very useful here you can knock sappers out of stealth. Uh, after a couple seconds, they'll lose their vanish, basically, if they get hit by an AE or dots or something like that. So make sure you're kind of watching where they vanish. Um, and then once they're out, you can stun them, death grip them, nuke them down really quickly. It's pretty simple. The second easiest thing is Onslaught. So Onslaught on Heroic does 1.2 million damage base. Um, and then it splits that damage to the ship and any other people that might be soaking it. So in our case, we always have eight people soak the onslaught, uh, leaving out our two tanks, and I'll talk about that later. So splitting it nine ways with eight people plus one is the ship. It's about 133,000 shadow damage uh, to everyone. So it's not too bad. And that number is, is important because every once in a while, people will be taking 50% extra shadow damage from a debuff. So I'll talk about that next. The final and most difficult mechanic to control the ship's health is Twilight Barrage. And just like on normal, this is cast by the two, uh, the pair of Onslaught, or excuse me, pair of Twilight Drakes on either side. And this is cast fairly frequently. Uh, when it hits the ship, if it's not soaked by any player, it will do 420,000 damage to the ship. However, this is a different value than it does to players. It does 300,000 damage to players. Uh, split among however many targets it hits. Uh, however, when it hits a player, it applies a debuff to those players 
uh, that lasts 15 seconds and increases the shadow damage they take by 50%. And this can stack. So you end up with this situation where if you soak uh, multiple barrages in a row, you're going to have, say, two stacks, 100% extra shadow damage. And in that case, you cannot soak an onslaught. If you have two stacks uh, and you go an onslaught, you'll die. It'll just take a huge amount of damage. So um, this leads to sort of some rules you have to come up with for your raid makeup and what cooldowns you have in terms of how you want to deal with soaking barrages and onslaughts secondarily. So we tried a few different methods for this and um, they have pros and cons for each, but the one we settled on that worked the best for us is to basically split our raid into small teams. So with our raid makeup, we have two tanks, two melee DPS, two healers, four range DPS. And we decided to split into two teams of three, one healer and two range DPS each. So as a resto healer, I'm with our balanced druid and our shadow priest sort of on the left side of the ship most of the fight. And our holy paladin, uh, warlock, and elemental shaman are the other pair of three or team of three on the other side, the right side. So generally speaking, we stay kind of near our sides so that in any situation, if a twilight barrage lands near us, we can all run over and soak it. So I was too slow there, but you may have seen that our priest and uh, our balance druid soak together. And this is the key of why three people works well. We tried pairs of two for a long time, but two is just too binary. You have situations where some uh, player in that partnership cannot get into the, the barrage or they just don't see it or whatever it might be. And suddenly you're left with one person in the barrage and they just die. But with three people, usually all three will, will see it and get in it and you'll be fine. But even if not all three get in it, at least two is a good backup and they will survive it and you'll be okay. The other major thing we did is most of the raid, not all of it, but most of the raid is using resist trinkets in the form of Mirror of uh, Broken Images from Tolbaran. And if you're unaware, this is basically a right click for 10 seconds uh, with a minute cooldown and it gives you 400 resistance to all resists. So this is extremely strong for this type of fight where magic damage on random raid members um, can be very high. So we've used it for you know, raid fights in the past, and just like those, it's very strong here. So using a Tolbarad Trinket, uh, Mirror of Broken Images, if you use that plus another minor cooldown of about 20% reduction or higher, depending what you have for your class, you can solo soak a Twilight Barrage. And this is very, very important and very useful. So as a Resto Healer, for example, um, I have my Trinket and Barkskin macro together, very simple. And I just use a, a mod to quickly tell me if I can use both of them. And if I'm safe to do so, if I'm full health, I can use both and solo soak a Twilight Barrage and survive. And this, you know, with multiple people doing this, this opens up a lot of freedom in terms of, you know, access to which barrages you can soak and how frequently you can get them. And this is very, very useful. Uh, the other thing is that with the debuff from Barrage, you have a couple rules about how you can soak things. So the basic rules that we came up with are if you have the trinket and at least a 20% reduction, as I said, you can solo soak if you have no debuff. If you have one stack of the debuff, 50% extra damage, you and another player, um, or excuse me, if you have one stack of the debuff, you need two other people to soak with you. Because if you have one debuff and two people soak it, it's basically um, 450,000 damage split two ways, so 225 before resists. So you have to get very, very lucky with resistance and reduction to survive that. So if you have the debuff, you need all three people in your trio to soak it. Um, but if you don't have any debuffs, then two people can soak it, as I mentioned before. And finally, if you have two debuffs, two stacks, you cannot soak anything. You shouldn't even get an onslaught. And that won't happen very often, but when it does, make sure you communicate with the raid and stand out of the onslaught and have extra raid cooldowns or even one of your tanks step in if you're doing 
eight people like we are. Uh, that said, if you have one debuff, you can survive Onslaught with eight people soaking it without too much trouble. Just use a, a raid cooldown of some sort. So both of our tanks have their four-piece bonus, and we also have Aura Mastery from our Paladin. So we use those pretty frequently for the Onslaught. Um, but it's not that scary most of the time. Whew, so that is Barrage and all the stuff therein that affects the ship's health. So let's talk about deck fire. Now the reason I emphasize how important it is to soak barrages on this fight is because deck fire, the new mechanic on Heroic, as you see in the bottom of the screen there, is based on the ship's health when it appears. So without a fail, every 25% of the ship's health, a patch of deck fire will appear at 75, 50, and 25 respectively. When a patch appears, it spawns in a random location on the main deck here. So the area everyone is standing in, this sort of light to darkish crosshatch brown area. Um, so if a patch of fire can appear in any spot on that platform. It cannot move onto the outer edges, so on the metallic white area, and it won't go upstairs or anything like that. But since no one else can hang out there really, it doesn't help you much. Uh, so that said, deck fire can be very random and problematic depending where it spawns. Um, since it spreads, once it appears in a random direction, if it spawns right in the center of the platform, it will spread outward from there and take up a lot of the platform very quickly. But since it can also spawn in say a back corner, if it does that, it will only spread you know, in two directions. It, it can't go in, in the corner or the wall or anything like that. So you get some random element there and it can be a little bit troublesome depending where it goes. That said, the key again is to limit the fire from spawning as much as possible. And you do this by soaking the barrages. If you can soak all of them or most of them, you can prevent that first deck fire, especially the one that happens at 75% from going off for a long, long time. So as we start the phase again, we'll watch here and you can see how this happens. Basically, we get the first two barrages there. Then we have an onslaught and our uh, off tank, which is our death knight. He gets the other two barrages that happen while we're in onslaught. Uh, does a really great job there. That final barrage in the bottom right, that actually doesn't damage the ship because as it turns out, if a drake launches a, a barrage but dies before the barrage hits then for whatever reason the game doesn't have a, an npc to associate that damage with and so the damage is not dealt so it's like the, it's like a cast time i guess for the drake uh, so essentially we're able to get through that first onslaught and get all the drakes down and we still haven't hit 75 percent and that's a huge boost for this fight if you can do that fire will be a lot more controlled and it's very rare to do that so truly try to focus on that uh, so we're about to get our first deck fire there it is at the bottom there but we've delayed it as much as we possibly can almost so that's really the key um, it's possible usually you'd have that deck fire you know a good 30 40 seconds prior and it will spread just that much faster the other problem with deck fire is that it appears and then these little sort of supposed to be helpful gnomes will float around above it. You can kind of see one at the bottom of the screen there. And they'll try to extinguish it. But they're very finicky. They're not very quick. They're not intelligent in any sense. So they don't really extinguish fire that's the most dangerous to you at all. And they spawn very slowly. And you'll see a lot of people will talk about general strategies that you try to get fire spawning close together. So like you get the first and the second fire patch right on top of each other. Um, and then the theory is that the gnomes will extinguish both patches while there's not very many fires active. But that's just foolish. Um, that relies on the AI to <laughs> extinguish the proper patches. And it assumes that you don't get spawns in the middle of the ship. Um, and it's, it's just a bad idea. So it's much better to delay the fire from even appearing if you can by soaking. So I highly recommend that. That also means that onslaughts should be soaked by the raid, the majority of the raid, all the time. 
a lot of strategies will suggest you use like a shadow priest solo or a shadow priest and a fire mage, that kind of thing. But because the onslaught splits damage among the ship and the number of players, even if one or two people can soak it, that's still 400,000 or 600,000 damage the ship is going to take. Whereas if you split it nine, nine ways or even 10 ways, uh, you're only talking 120, 133,000. So it's a much smaller amount. So again, you should always soak with the raid if you can afford to do it, um, just because you'll delay that fire from initially spawning. So yeah, deck fire is kind of a pain, but that's really the crux of it. If you can delay it, you can handle um, sort of the spread of it much easier than if you have it spawn really early. So let's go ahead and move on and talk about the ads. So just like on the normal version of this fight, you have two elite ads that will spawn and they're dropped by the two assault drakes. Um, and these pairs continue, there's three sets of them. So generally speaking, you want enough DPS on the assault drakes so that they die before they go back up away from the harpoon and start to fly around again. Uh, that's sort of your DPS benchmark. And the reason for that is because if they fly around again, they'll drop more barrages, delay the fight. You might even get an extra broadside from Goriona, uh, all that stuff. So they can survive a couple seconds after they fly away if they die from dots. But if they fly off and they're gone again for a while, your DPS is not high enough on the drakes. You really want them higher. So if you have that locked down, then the next thing is to put all your DPS uh, on the sapper, of course, primarily, and then the two Twilight Elites, the melee guys. So the Elites are really the challenging ad that you have to deal with for this phase. And the reason is pretty much their only uh, annoying ability, which is their Blade Rush or Charge. So just like a normal, uh, every about 13 to 20 seconds, it varies, they'll pick a random raid member and charge toward them. The problem is that from the time they actually pick the charge target to when they actually activate the ability uh, is about four seconds or less. And it's very, very quick. So reaction times have to be extremely fast to avoid it. And it takes a lot of practice. This was probably the one thing that killed us more than anything when learning this fight. Uh, so a few tips uh, to deal with this. As I mentioned, it's the cooldown is variable timing, but it does have some timings that will always be the same. So for example, right there, you see how they're charging just after onslaught. That's very common. So you want to get in the habit of when you soak for an onslaught, uh, if charges do, announcing to the raid, make sure everyone knows that charge is coming and they need to sidestep out of it. Sidestepping is very key to avoid charge. The reason for this is when they pick a target and you see the graphic on the ground, that graphic extends from their current location to the target location. However, the charge itself, uh, the damage area that it deals is from their the location of the mob to the location they targeted and then extends a good 10, almost 15 yards beyond that location in a straight line. So essentially, they're charging in a straight line and doing damage to everything well beyond the target location that they picked. And it's just some design quirk. I don't know why it works this way, but it's very frustrating. So basically what it means is if you are targeted to get charged or someone near you is in a straight line with you, if you back away to avoid the charge and you just think, well, I'm not in that charge graphic, I'm okay. If you're in a straight line with the charge, you're still going to get hit most likely, which is bad, of course. So the key is to always sidestep to avoid charge. If charge is coming toward you, sidestep to get out of it and you will avoid it. So again, if, if you're doing an onslaught soak, the raid should all sidestep simultaneously so that charge will target the locations that the players were, not where they are at current. Um, yeah, so if you can get charge down pat, then most of this first phase will be manageable. You just have to deal with, um, you know, add damage to the tanks and then random barrage damage. So other than that, the drakes, as I mentioned, should all be dying very quickly, but you'll see that we're tanking the melee adds on the left side under one of the drakes locations. 
And this is just for extra DPS on the Drake on one side. Uh, this allows any melee that have easy cleave damage, um, like our warrior tank, for example. When he's tanking, he can just cleave three things over and over and over and, you know, do shockwave and rend and all that good stuff, uh, along with like our death knight, DPS, and all that adds up. So it's a way to get extra damage on that Drake so that your stronger DPS can focus on the Drake that's not near anybody else. So we have our two casters of legendaries on the Drake on the right, whereas our other non-legendary casters are on the left side and the melee add a little extra DPS to that. So it helps even things out. Um, that said, the downside is that this means that your tank can't really move. And if that's a problem for you, if that you need them to soak onslaught, the strategy might not work as well. Because if you move into onslaught with the tank, cleaves are a big problem. You have to be very careful about where you face melee mobs because cleaves will hit everyone <laughs> very frequently. So we just choose to soak Onslaught with eight players, as I mentioned. Uh, and this allows our tank that's on the adds to be off to the side. I should also mention that we're only using one tank on each pair of adds. So we don't split them one on one and one on the other. And this allows you to have the other tank free to soak up Barrage, which I talked about before, like our Death Knight was doing that. So um, it's very helpful to do that. So the final thing is that even though I said you should kill all the assault drakes before they go up, we found that if you are good at managing the ship's health, which we do a pretty good job here, um, once you get to that final third set, you can purposely avoid killing one of the drakes and buy yourself extra time to get these um, adds down, the melee adds, and then finish off the assault drake. So we purposely leave the right one alive burn down the melee adds, and then when the drake comes back down or we're safe and, you know, we have enough time, then we kill him off, and then we can continue on with the phase. So, that's the adds. Let's go ahead and talk about phase two. Now, just like a normal difficulty, uh, the second phase begins once the final assault drake, or the sixth assault drake, dies. Um, so, this also means that the berserk timer begins as soon as more master comes down. The Berserk is four minutes from when he drops, and they don't Berserk. So this is also why we're delaying that final Drake on the right side and that third pair, so that we can deal with all the melee adds. And, and at this point, when we go to the phase, all our DPS for those four minutes is spent attacking appropriate targets. Um, generally speaking, the second phase is not as difficult as the first phase, in my opinion. Um, in terms of number of tries that we actually got to this phase, before we got a kill um, where everyone was alive. You know, it's it's very few, probably five or six total before we got the kill here. And it's not clean by any measure, you'll see, but it's much simpler in this phase uh, overall than the first part of the fight. So once you master the first half, this should not be as troublesome. Um, that said, the transition going into this phase, specifically while Goriona is alive, is much more difficult than once you know she's cleared out and you're sort of safely into the phase. So there's a few reasons for that. Um, the first is that is that when the phase begins, Goriona's still flying above like on normal. All your ranged DPS should nuke her really quick. Um, she'll continue to drop shadow patches on the ground in random places. So make sure your rate sort of spreads out because you don't want all your ranged you know stacked up and eating shadow damage. It ticks really hard. Uh, the other reason is that when she hits about 80% health, she will come down and land on the ship, like you see there. So once she's on the ship, she needs to be tanked by whichever tank is not on Warmaster. Uh, we generally will swap just before Goriona lands so that the fresh tank on Warmaster doesn't have any Sunder stacks uh, because he hits really, really hard. And DPS should immediately go to Goriona focus on her. You can use cleave damage, like, you know, if you have a com combat rogue, or something like that, obviously that's okay. You want extra DPS, but just be aware that most of your DPS should be on Goriona. While she's active, she doesn't have any sort of cleave um, attack, direct attack, but she does have a breath attack in front of her as a cone. So it's important that whichever tank is on her faces her away from the rest of the raid. And you're, basically your melee should be somewhere besides 
the front of Goriona. Um, once she gets to about 20% health, she'll fly away, so you don't have to actually kill her. But you do have to focus her first. If you don't focus her down, or Master will soak her life, basically. So it doesn't really benefit you. He just gets low health and a bunch of vengeance. But you don't actually kill him any faster. Um, while Goriana is active, she will also use a random debuff on a raid member, which is uh, consuming Shroud. And this basically causes that player to absorb healing, up to 100,000 healing. And any healing done to that player will be uh, emitted from them in AE damage to the raid. So if you heal for 20,000, 20,000 damage is done to everyone else. Um, and it's kind of a pain. So what we found that worked pretty well is to use AE heals uh, like Tranquility or uh, Priest Tranquility. Uh, obviously, if you have a Shaman healer, um, that'd be a good time for their totem, all that good stuff. So basically, you want to heal everyone equivalent. You know, when you're healing the player with the debuff, you also want to heal the rest of the raid so that you don't spike that player and explode everyone else, especially the tanks. Uh, otherwise, once Gurion is gone, the fight becomes a lot easier. By then, most of the fire will be extinguished by the little gnomes that are floating around. So you should have most of the platform to spread out as you need to. And then mechanically, it's just like the normal version of the fight. Um, it's just everything is much more challenging in terms of damage and you know how much it does so uh war master hits really really hard as i mentioned um, you basically want to swap at two stacks of the devastator sundry debuff so the timing will be such that just as that third stack hits one of the tanks uh, the new tank will be dropping his stack so your tank that is dropping a stack should be counting down to taunt at you know with the debuff timer that they have so that they taunt just you know half a second after their debuff drops um, if you wait any longer chances are the other tank is going to take that third devastate and a follow-up melee swing with three stacks and just get splattered so and then of course normal tank cooldowns are very useful um, it's kind of a toss-up whether you want to use them for devastate or for the disrupting roar but generally speaking, if your tanks have four piece, then they should use them for the disrupting roar. The timing is not exact on the cooldown, so you have to kind of estimate it though. And yeah, so other than that, it's all about uh, dodging shockwave just like normal. So we sort of split up into kind of four camps. Um, so we have our ranged and healer trios kind of in, in one marker where I'm standing. There's one at the green marker to the right. Then we have our tanks in the the front and the side markers, purple and red, respectively. And then our melee at whichever one is, is unoccupied. Um, and this way, in a worst case scenario, was that one healer is moving from Shockwave at any given time. But the other healer is free to keep healing the tanks. Because, again, spike damage is very high on them. So that covers most of phase two, so let's go ahead and loop back through, and we'll go through the full fight, and let's do the final breakdown stuff. So as we go back to the start of the fight, uh, as you can see, we're all stacked at the top here, and as I think I mentioned, this is to get initial nukes as that Drake swoops around. You can kind of see how he curved around that path. So as a druid, for example, I can get two wraths and then follow up with two, two dots before he's out of my range. And then as I drop down, I can dot the other drake that passes over. That's just good initial damage. And you can see we're sort of splitting in our trios. So my trio is kind of in the left quadrant of the ship. Although I'll still help on either side if I'm in range to soak barrages. And the other trio is on the right. And then as we move over to get this barrage, our death knight in the bottom left of my screen is able actually to pick up both those barrages while we're in onslaught. So that's a really good example of how helpful that can be. And Death Knight tanks, in, a, in particular, are very strong at soaking barrage. Uh, our warrior has picked up both the adds and tanked them on the yellow on the side. And this way he can, as I mentioned, stay stationary and use his cleave damage on the drake. Um, and then the rest of the raid will soak the onslaught with the raid cooldown when, need, when needed. Uh, the initial threat on these melee adds when they drop down is very finicky. 
So especially as a healer and a druid healer in, in particular, because you have hot sticking all the time, you want to be very careful about how close you get to the ads. So generally speaking, if if onslaught is coming when the ads are dropping down, I do my best to stay at the very outside edge of onslaught away from where they drop because the ads tend to uh, have very uh, iffy threat at the start. And I think this is due to, we've seen it in similar mechanics on other raid fights when mobs are dropped from the sky and they sort of have strange threat building before they actually get on the same plane, same axis as the raid. So it can tend to be that even when tanks are hitting them or taunting, you know, once they're actually on the ground, then they actually are building threat. And so other people might have initial threat before the tank. So just something to be aware of. Uh, so you can see we've got our first deck fire and the robots or gnomes, whatever they are, are sort of extinguishing it, but not too efficiently. And we've got our third set of adds. This uh, onslaught and the adds and the sapper all happen simultaneously. So just communicate for that sapper. Uh, death knight death grips are extremely strong for sappers. And then of course use stuns. You should also try to knock them out of their, um, their stealth with some AE that you have. And otherwise continue soaking. So we're trying to get barrages. And I mentioned uh, that no solo that's flashing. That's just add on for me so that I know when my trinket and bark skin are available or not available in this case. And we've uh, managed to get the ship uh, very stable health. So we, we call out and mumble not to kill that final Drake right away so we can get those ads down. So we finish off the melee ads there and then we finish off the Drake on the right. And now we're able to enter the phase with the Berserk Timer just at the right timing. So we have everything dead that we can. And again, there you saw War Master. He goes after me temporarily because he's building threat on me before the tank. Um, but find, you know the tick and then the taunt eventually tick. So as long as I'm far enough away, I don't get hit. And as I mentioned, this transition phase is very dangerous. Uh, you've got these shadow things plopping down. It's almost lucky that they hit me because I'm by myself over here. So the rest of the raid doesn't really get hit by it. And then the dragon's down, so I'm okay. I kind of get myself cornered. It's probably a bad spot, so I move around so I have a little more room to move for shockwave. Um, but essentially, we're just trying to prepare for when shockwave's going to hit and then keep everyone topped off enough so that if they happen to get hit by one shockwave or a, a roar, they won't die. And as long as we can keep everyone stable from that, uh, then we can get Goriona down. And then the phase will become a lot more simple. Uh, I think I mentioned we're using two healers. Uh, our normal two healer setup, myself as a druid and our holy paladin. And not really the best healers for this. Um, you know, you ideally you'd want inspiration from a, a shaman or a priest because or master hits so freaking hard. Um, and you also, you know, extra damage absorption from shields or just the health boost from a shaman would be very useful on the first phase as well. But I mean, obviously it works. We, we managed to make do. And you can see, we're just trying to get in our general positions once the shadow and the fire are safely gone. And so we have our trios in their basic spots. Um, the important thing is to stay as close to Blackhorn as you can without being in that 10 yard radius of his silence. So we kind of have these general positions so that people can, you know, be able to get out of shockwave in time. It doesn't always happen. Uh, I get hit myself, but for the most part, you should be able to get out of it if you are really ready for it and you're moving the right direction. And yeah, there, I got hit there. So uh, at this point, if you just slowly heal up the raid, then you should be okay to focus on the tanks. So you can see that the tanks are sort of swapping, um, as I mentioned, when their stacks drop or when the other tank hits two stacks. Um, other than that, you know, cooldowns should be used for disrupting roar ideally. Uh, Devastate is, is the most damaging single target attack on the tank, 
but since disrupting roar is more overall damage to the raid, we try to use them for that most of the time. And the other thing is that um, both of those, disrupting roar and devastate, are off the sort of melee swing attack. So the combination can be pretty spiky on those tanks. And But from this point forward, I'm mostly focusing on the tanks. And you can see we still mess up at some point here. But that is Heroic Warmaster Blackhorn. So good luck and thanks for watching. Hope you enjoy this epic win that you're about to witness. No, I won't. <laughs> yeah. One thing I'm going to talk, I guess, too. Serpent. Taunting. Raid cooldown. You got my VB for that. Fuck. Fuck. Eh, yeah, berserk anyways. Rising death. I can pop. Spread. Kill him, kill Just him. do it. Just do it. Just pop. pop, pop, pop. Hiding as much as possible. Oh my god! Yeah! Wow. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Holy what shit. What the fuck was that? That Killers. was retarded. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Jesus. Oh, he had 7k. I can't believe he went down. Well, I've had a heart attack. So good. <laughs> yeah, I did too. Oh, that felt so good. The worst part is after I died and onked, three pieces of my gear were broken. And I'm like, if we fucking die because three pieces of my gear were fucking broken, I'm going to be pissed. Wow. Well done.